Good evening. My name is Alexander Hagen. I'm a CEO of a small, medium-sized tech company in Silicon Valley. Previously, I've been a financial analyst and financial journalist and research engineer. Uh, tonight, I want to address the issue of the ambassador who was killed along with the three diplomats. My question is, how do we attribute significance to their deaths? What can we do in the name of this incident to right this wrong? What is the wrong that we are to right? And we have two different uh, manipulated distortions of reality at play. One is this group of people that produced this video about Islam uh, that was deliberately designed to get people killed. And I believe that that is at the same level as uh, shouting fire in a crowded theater, except much, much, much worse. If you produce a piece of work that in every case previously has resulted in hundreds or thousands of deaths when it was published, then you are essentially committing conspiracy to commit murder when you release such a work in such a fashion. So this is one distorted, manipulated version of uh, reality. And uh, it's a can't-lose scenario because it isolates the West from the Arab and Muslim world, the portions of it that Israel wants to drive uh, the West away from. This particular group's uh, perspective, if they're intelligent enough to have planned what I just described. <clears throat> now, the other distorted view of reality is what we were doing in Libya and why. So we have not been given correct information. And uh, basically, if you knew what I have found out over the last 1,500 or 2,000 hours of study, um, you would realize that the uh, White House and the media both took you into a war that's going to have potential reverberation on millions of people's lives without letting you have the information to advocate or understand whether war or peace was in your behalf. So in the beginning, there's the big Benghazi lie. So the big Benghazi lie, right? Uh, the, the outbreak during the Arab Spring in Benghazi on February 17th, I believe, 2011, uh, there was a, f a few hundred people killed in an uprising where they obtained weaponry. Um, but uh, the rebels never massed more than 3,000 people, and I was supporting them at the time, and I was very puzzled how few of the sons these regions were giving to the conflict. Uh, and then later on, it all became much clearer. Um, but I noticed something was wrong right then and there. Gaddafi was rolling them back up into Benghazi. He had made various uh, martial, spirited speeches, which uh, could be viewed as uh, uh, with bravado about uh, straightening out the people in Benghazi. And this was gleefully uh, glommed onto by the Western rulers and media to justify what they were about to do. So they got UN Resolution 1973, which said there was no arming of either side, for example. There was to be no fly. In fact, the Allies flew people back and forth between the uh, mountains where the uh, indigenous um, Amazigh Berber people lived and uh, to coordinate with the jihadists in Benghazi. Uh, the, uh, so they're basically, you know, uh, four or five different groups that represented the opposition. There was uh, various cities, states, and uh, tribal groups and configurations that were uh, aligned against uh, the uh, Gaddafi-aligned uh, tribes and uh, groups. So, for example, Mizratans hate or Fallens of Beni Walid and the vice versa. And uh, the Beni Walid is the last stronghold of Gaddafi loyalists. <clears throat> So, this Benghazi lie also uh, consisted of um, rapidly circulating unverified rumors gleefully. Again, this is like grist for some kind of mill. Absolutely, if you study the papers over the year, 
they will print any nonsense they could get um, to discredit Gaddafi and justify the war. So basically what I wanted to show you, you may not be able to see it very well, but so I'll just make a red box everywhere. So Benghazi on February 17th, I believe, that was the day of the uprising. We were never told the background on Libya. Um, we were never told Libya had the highest standard of living in Africa, that actually Gaddafi did have support, uh, that actually we were in league with Saudi Arabia and Qatar, uh, who were pushing a very virulent form of anti-women Islam, and, um, uh, and, and now they're shoving it down the uh, uh, people in Libya's throats uh, by destroying their uh, shrines, burning libraries of saints of uh, the Sufis, desecrating graves, having to hide Roman statues, uh, all of these sort of phenomena, because they're actually pushing the Saudis and Qataris who armed the Islamists in Libya, uh, who were basically, the Qataris and the Islamists were 80% of the, uh, the rebels, uh, although you might want to look at Misrata a bit differently, uh, the city-state of Misrata. Uh, okay, so we, uh, Benghazi broke out. When we made the decision to put in UN 1973 resolution to create a ceasefire and a no-fly zone to lead the peace talks, the background is we were never told a number of important things about Libya, which if you stay tuned and I describe to you, you'll realize we had to know. Regardless of how you feel about the facts that are not being discussed, meant what is about to be described. So we sabotaged the talks with Gaddafi by requiring him to already be gone before we talked to him as a precondition. It's obviously a very high-handed precondition. A very high-handed precondition that is meant not to encourage peace, but absolute uh, obedience and surrender and prostration, as you still may be killed and jailed, uh, or um, your uh, destruction. Uh, so, uh, let's see here, uh, sabotage of uh, diplomacy by saying he has to leave and that he cannot be there, he has to go, and in fact, how can you be in negotiations with somebody who's gone? Uh, and uh, this put into the balance peace and conquest as the two options for the U.S. after UN 1973 was enacted. And instead of uh, choosing a path of peace, which is one where you're not in total control, um, because you don't have a gun right up to their head at that very second, you would have to at least ready the weapon. Um, but the advantage of peace is no one gets killed. And you can always start a war anytime you want. But this was not tried. Um, anybody who says it was is full of it. Uh, but the funny thing is that, you know, I thought these people were evil, but I think a lot of them actually believe their own um, uh, bile. <clears throat> so the question is, the decision to go into war mode has created horrible blowback. It, um, and so I will go through the blowback articles. So first of all, you should have any doubt that the Libyans were ready to negotiate elections immediately by June. This came out on July 3rd of last year, five months before his dad died, roughly four and a half. You want democracy? You want democracy done? You want election done? Mobilization for the constitution done. There were reformists such as Saif al Islam in Libya prior to this uprising. But let's not get uh, caught away from ourselves. The key question. This is evidence that we probably could have tried peace, and uh, I maintain we didn't. And the South African protester that I saw actually put it best in my mind. He said, 
These, the West is bloodthirsty. They can only understand violence. They do not understand diplomacy. <clears throat> and, um, and this did seem to be the case. Um, the mission uh, probably ended up killing around 30,000 Libyans. And Libya has a population in New York City. So 10 times more than 9-11 in New York. Uh, and, that's, uh, and there's also 10,000 people being held without charges, many of which are being tortured. There's a, uh, 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 the beginning of muzzling of women after women had legal equal rights under the socialist uh, Gaddafi Jamahiriya state. Um, we took a military response to a diplomatic problem, yet here, ironically, ultimately, was the diplomats who died. The State Department under Clinton has adopted a very aggressive stance, eschewing diplomacy for violence in Pakistan, Afghanistan, Syria, Palestine, Yemen, and Libya. Was it arrogance or ignorance? And also ironic is that Gaddafi himself came to power in a bloodless coup when for us to achieve this change nearly destroyed their country. So Gaddafi actually just drove a tank in 1969, apparently, into the, uh, the king's quarters and demanded he abdicate, and he did so. Um, and this, incredibly, it seems to be an actual truth. And then there was a young officer circle that was very popular until about 1975 that drove literacy up sharply, every metric of sharply. Libya was not a poor country. It was a police state, uh, uh, I would hazard to say. They had a small prison population, a quarter of the U.S. incarceration rate. Will the West ever take responsibility for the consequences of its violent, diplomacy-free, humanitarian intervention? How is dropping bombs humanitarian? How is the big lie of a hypothetical massacre in Benghazi that might have taken place justification for the events that have transpired? In actual fact, the uh, passing of UN Resolution 1973 is, is not really the issue. The issue is the abuse of the resolution. The idea of halting hostilities at the edge of Benghazi is a separate issue one can debate. But this issue is one of taking a resolution designed to lead to peace and forcing it to go to war. So who made this decision? And did they realize that the blowback would include destabilizing all of North Africa with Al-Qaeda-like groups stimulated with weapons? Uh, the Tuaregs came turned out of uh, Libya, who were actually, the Tuaregs were, Gaddafi had more broad-based support than people think, because actually uh, the Tuaregs were not even in my list of um, pro-Gaddafi units. I mean, all of these other guys down here in the southwest were pro-Gaddafi practically, except for the Tuareg, and here they were ending up aligned with him after the NATO intervention. This area was uh, not at all allied to Gaddafi, and here Beni Walid uh, is holding out. It turns out the people who held up the airport a couple months ago were, in fact, Gaddafi loyalists. They penetrated the intelligence service. They uh, done bombs, and many of these uh, ethnic conflicts inside Libya are deliberately being dumbed down so that we don't get to know that they're Gaddafi loyalists. Uh, nobody with actual training gets to examine this information and say, um, these people are traditionally allied with Gaddafi or currently are. Nobody knows. They're just two different tribes, and so we have to go out and scrape this information off. It's just shameful because the, the key bedrock issue uh, for the Libyan future, um, from a stability point of view, regardless of your feelings about the intervention, uh, which 10 out of 10 Arab countries all opposed when polled by Gallup, which didn't even bother to poll Libya. Uh, but um, anyways, you see here we have the Warfala there were aligned towards Gaddafi after NATO intervention, which drove them to be sympathetic with him, whereas previously they were against him when it was still just a civil matter. Many people went over to Gaddafi when it went from a uh, political crisis to a foreign military intervention crisis. The Tarhuna, they were the ones that actually captured the Tripoli airport and are suspected of having been involved with bombings. Um, uh, from the loyalist point of view, um, then, of course, the Gaddafi and Sirt, various people in the south here, 
Um, in theory, elements of Tripoli, definitely. Uh, so there is still support for that uh, that uh, sympathy. And the defeat of the Islamists in the election, the Islamists were the pro one of the primary parties that was involved in this uprising. Uh, tribes that were alienated from Gaddafi didn't take as much to, uh, to go over. Um, the other aspect were the uh, remnants of the Libyan Independent Fighting Group. Um, the Libyan Independent Fighting Group uh, were Islamic extremists uh, that raged a bitter, bitter, a bitter civil war uh, in Libya, and uh, Saif al-Islam uh, released them. And um, then they ended up, ironically, uh, killing his father, or certainly enabling it. So this has been the document I've been maintaining on blowback consequences of this decision to militarize rather than treat diplomatically um, the uh, UN 1973, which um, I put over, I hope this thing will move over here, as this tree here, peace and conquest. And so we chose conquest. And so what are the consequences of this? So in terms of background, I described here um, that Libya, let's see if I can get to it. Well, let's just stay at the high level. I'll just uh, reel off one item here. Okay, that's the UN resolution. And this I have posted on Microtopia. I'll put the link in the article description. So this shows the human development of Libya. Libya is green. It, it exceeds the baseline of high human development, exceeds all countries in Africa. I have reams and reams of statistics about this on that same uh, page, Libya Conflict Intel, you can just Google that, and at the bottom of that page are, are downloads. So, um, so in terms of uh, uh, blowback, first of all, we were not, uh, many civilians were bombed in Libya and seared by NATO. So protection of civilians was a joke and seared. Uh, no fly zone, we flew there. Uh, the rebels around. Enforcement of the arms embargo, Qatar uh, funneled in troops and uh, weaponry that so much of it that some Qatari inbound weaponry now got transshipped to Syria along with a lot of these Libyan radicals have gone to Syria to fight. Ban on flights, <clears throat> uh, asset freeze, uh, designations, panel of experts. Uh, so uh, the um, uh, UN resolution indicated that we were supposed to have the African Union talk to Gaddafi. And uh, his son was ready to allow elections in a constitution. Many in his inner circle were ready to do this. They had a highly growing economy. Um, other than this uh, horror they were facing, things had been going very well for them, although they had disarmed voluntarily. So then we had the media uh, report all this nonsense about rape and Viagra and heavy weapons use on civilians, which actually did occur in Abu Salim, but it was the rebels pointing them at Gaddafi loyalists, and it's in the New York Times. Um, then uh, the strikes uh, by NATO, uh, which drove sympathies against this intervention, uh, was opposed in the Arab world. NATO actually literally killed the Libyan TV people. So all of this contributes to an uh, impression of us in Russia and India and Africa and South America that we are pretty dangerous people. That's for sure. Um, and then uh, we have the destabilization of all of Northern Africa. In this article, there's predicted potentially hundreds of thousands of dead because they're very fragile communities in Mali and Mauritania and all of that. Uh, and huge refugees, they're already uh, near refugee status, and there's probably been droughts. Uh, so uh, pushing these people in and destabilizing it could actually be something that could cause mass death. So I have uh, many pages of this blowback. The, you know, the government, central government leadership were involved in demolishing national Sufi shrines from the 1500s. Now, how can you tell me that war is better than peace when you have the government now actively involved in this?
and um, uh, and having Saudi Arabia and Qatar allied with us to impose Wahhabism. Uh, what is all about this? A lot of uh, you know bad things were done to blacks um, because of suspicions that they might have been. Um, <clears throat> Uh, mercenaries, but the blacks that were lynched were basically workers. Uh, they had a, about a million ex, quasi expatriate people as workers in Libya. The destruction of Timbuktu, um, the, oh God, what else can we say? A lot of attacks in Libya. <clears throat> so I don't wish any worse for the Libyans, but the question is who introduced this? Um, decision to use war instead of peace who had information that should have been discussed um, that indicated we had all these risk factors of accelerating uh, a beautiful Al-Qaeda recruiting ground in Libya and at the same time this uh, funneling them into Syria destabilizing Syria Syria's government of Assad is Shiite so is Iraq I've been waiting for the shoe to fall, and now Iraq's Shiite leadership is going to line up with Iran's and Syria's because of Sunni extremists. So this is the end of part two.